I am here at the Torch Center with my dear friend, Rabbi Moshe Gewurz. It's so nice to have you here. How are things? Nice to be here. Yeah, definitely being here at the Torch Center where so much magic happens is an honor and a pleasure. Rabbi Gewurz is an old friend of mine. We are family. So his sister is my sister-in-law. His sister's older sister, Zahava, Zahava Walby. She, uh, I was going to say upgraded, but I don't want to start fighting quite yet. <laughs> from a Gewurz to a Wolby, I apologize. No, she transitioned from uh, a Gewurz to a Wolby many years ago, and we've been friends. We were in, in yeshiva together in the mirror, you recall? Oh, that's been a long time ago. And we, we, st- we were study partners. I'm not going to revisit those old wounds of what happened when we stopped being study partners. It still steams me a little bit, but I guess... A little bit of rejection, it helps stiffen you, gives you some thick skin, and it makes you able to deal with life's challenges. I was not planning on bringing you onto the podcast to talk about that, but whatever, it's it's out there now. Everyone knows. You have nothing to say about that. No. You don't even remember it. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> so, Robert Gewurz. All good memories, that's for sure. Yeah, certainly, to get rid of this Harusa study partner. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. Whatever. Water under the bridge. Uh, it's only been like, what, 20 years, so only stings just a little bit. A, little, uh, a few gray hairs later, here we are today. Yes, yes. So I want to bring you here to talk about about what you do. Robert Gewurz is the director of an organization called Renewal. And what they do, I don't want to misspeak, but what I understand is that they connect kidney, uh, altruistic kidney donors with recipients, and they facilitate every element of that of that transaction. Is that right? That is correct. Renewal is at the forefront of kidney transplant in the world, actually. It's a Jewish organization uh, who, like Rabbi Wolby just said, connects potential kidney donors with uh, the ability to give and save someone's life. So I want to talk about this. I want to hear more about this incredible organization. I want to understand maybe everything, that, well, a, a lot about it. So let's start from the beginning. You know, we we all have we're all born. Or maybe that's not true, but most people are born with two kidneys. Is that right? You want to hear something fascinating? Yes. Actually, one in a thousand actually are born with one kidney. With only but one kidney. Nine hundred ninety nine. We it's safe the to assume standard. You yeah, have two kidneys. The standard hardware that most people come with is is two kidneys in your lower back. That's correct. And these things do what? <laughs> so the main function of the kidney is it filters the blood. Uh, it does many, many functions, but without this filtering process, all sorts of toxins build up in the human body, and uh, the person, unfortunately, starts to break down in many areas. So someone – okay, let's just ask a silly question. Someone doesn't have a kidney, or any kidneys, if whatever, they were taken away, whatever. They're dead within how long? They're dead very soon, right? They're dead very soon, but uh, thank God there's something called dialysis, okay, uh, which does prolong the life of the – person in in the recipient. Very, very painful. Uh, it's something that they have to do multiple times a week. And um, it, it it does take, it does do 15% of the function of a kidney. Okay. So normally someone's born with two kidneys, thank God, or, or one, okay. Uh, but they have kidneys and that filters the toxins out of the blood primarily. It does other functions, but it's, it's a filter effectively, which cleans out all the problems that we have within us. You know, you know, we, we, we had this pandemic, right? And all the little viruses and all the little things, all these invisible things that exist in our environment and in our body and they could potentially be very harmful and they're floating all around. And we have these, these two kidneys. Is that right? Am I describing this correctly? Yes. Yes. They're a factory of, of, Cleaning out the blood and also creating some enzyme, enzymes. Yeah. So very helpful. Thank you, Almighty God, for giving us. Yes. We wouldn't be able to live a day without our kidneys. Yes. They're very helpful. So they're very important, but there's a lot of people that don't either don't have them or their, their kidneys failed. So talk to me about that. What, what, like, why would someone not have functioning kidneys? What, what's that like? So they could not have functioning kidneys for any number of reasons. Um, the main thing is any, uh, s- s- there are various forms of kidney diseases, which causes the kidney to start to start to lose function, and uh, when they lose function, essentially toxins start to build up in the body, and they no so longer. So the kidneys degrade. The kidneys degrade over time. Some people it's a slow process. Some people it happens very quickly. One minute to the next, they have 
essentially no functioning kidneys and their life crumbles. It's in real peril. In real peril is for sure. And, and, and like what would the symptoms be? The symptoms would be a lot of people discover it through doing some uh, blood tests. They they start to feel very lethargic. Their color starts to change. And um, you, they just start to uh, start experiencing all sorts of symptoms because essentially your kidneys don't work. Everything else in the body is going to start to so it's, start So it's not like down. an isolated organ that does one thing. It, every a kidney has its hand, so to speak, everywhere. Every uh, you, the human body to function properly, it, it needs the kidneys because every part of your body is there's the the blood is doing so much work in your body, and the blood is not working well. It's not properly filtered without the kidney. So you got to be someone has someone has kidney failure. Everything starts to to break down. Yes, we have a perfect body, and without it, uh, all the different parts in it. It's all, it all works together and choreographed perfectly and without the kidneys, things. So come. someone, God forbid, they have kidney failure and they go to get the blood test full of toxins in the blood. They check the kidneys. Kidneys are either degrading or they're non-functional. What happens next? What are their options? What are their options? So they have essentially two options. Number one is dialysis. Dialysis is a process of using a machine that filters the blood. It does 15% of the function of a kidney, which is not a great job. Which means means the, it, it does the functions of the kidney, but only 15% as well as a natural kidney? Correct. Correct. Okay. So really what's what's going on is they're going to a center three times a week. Uh, they're not gonna, there's different types of dialysis, but essentially they're hooked up to a machine for hours. They come back drained. Uh, the toxins again are still building up a uh, little bit in the body because eighty five percent is not being covered. Is not, is not working right. So, in fact, statistics are that after five years on dialysis, over seventy percent of people are no longer alive because slowly their body is breaking down. So that's the first option that they have is dialysis. The other option is transplant. That means finding some very altruistic person out there. And who would donate their kidney to save their life. You're saying because people have two kidneys and you only really need one. Is that right? That's correct. They've, they've, I want to tell you something fascinating. How do they know that you have one kidney is, is enough to function? They actually discovered this during World War II. During World War II, there were th- hundreds of thousands of soldiers that went over to fight in Germany. And unfortunately, many of them stepped on mines and, that caused all sorts of injuries. And there was a large group of people that lost one kidney from stepping on mines. And they followed those people for years. And they said, hey, these people, even though they only have one kidney, they, as far as their kidney function it, uh, goes, they're functioning just like so everyone else. So we have else. like a spare tire. There's like redundancy built in. The kidneys are so important that we have a backup kidney and they're working, I guess, Someone who's healthy has two healthy kidneys. They're worth. They're both working together, right, in conjunction with each other. But really, one is enough. And God forbid, someone loses one, then the other one is sufficient. Correct. I would. I would correct that a little bit. Is that it's not totally redundant. Um, the with one kidney, people do tend to, if they develop high blood pressure, um, they do. Sorry. They de- they tend to develop high blood pressure at a slightly higher rate than the rest of the population, meaning most of the population, as they age, develop high blood pressure. People that only have one kidney do have a slightly higher rate of high blood pressure than the rest but of the population. But in the grand scheme of things of what the, li- what the kidney does, it's effectively insignificant compared to all the other issues that someone who doesn't have any kidneys – uh, would have, right? So, Correct. Correct. So e- effectively, the, the kidney works just as well, one kidney versus two, but there is this slight increase in, in I guess, the um, the speed by with which someone goes into a pattern of high blood pressure. Because you, like you said, most old people anyhow have high blood pressure. Correct. And again, I just want to stress, like I don't know anything about this. Like The audience should know. Like I, We're just talking. We're old friends. We're talking. Uh, we'll hear more about what the organization does. So, so don't take any medical advice from me, for sure. Okay? That's not what I was trained in yeshiva. We studied yeshiva together. None of this was part of the curriculum. Is that right? Yes. Absolutely not. You know. Okay. Okay. So let's, let, let, let's, let's talk more about this. So you said that kidney failure is catastrophic. Option one is... Dialysis, 
that's not ideal. Is it three times a week? It's very long. It's very painful. It's very draining. And after five years, people are in fact, uh, on average. Or I don't know what the numbers are, but it's it's it, it erodes the quality of life. Really erodes over time, and eventually people really succumb because it's not doing as good of a job. But there's something called kidney transplant. Tell me about the kidney transplant. What does that mean? So kidney transplant essentially uh, that that could happen one of two ways. Either uh, from a cadaver kidney. That means there's a national waiting list. It's around seven years long. Okay. And like I just described to you, after five years, most people are no longer alive. Because they have to be on dialysis in the interim. Correct. So, okay. Se- so, so that a- means a cadaver, someone's on a motorcycle, they die, they put on their license, they want to donate their organs upon death, and they start piecing out the organs, then it goes to the next in line. Correct. But okay. the, the national waiting list is over 100,000 people waiting. So For kidneys. For kidneys. So it's really, uh, it, it'll take a long time. And unfortunately, like I did, we described before, the body is slowly breaking down during that time. The other option is to get it from a live donor. That means somebody who is willing to go through a kidney transplant. It has no benefit to themselves, no medical benefit to themselves, but they're willing to go through this procedure, this this operation, in order to save somebody else's life. And uh, that's kind of where we come in. Okay. So t- uh, tell me more. What do y'all do? What's this like? So we have a process where people register here at, with us and renewal. We have a, a list of over 300 people at any given time. There's so many people in need who, who need of it. Me, the general registry that the, the national registry says over 100,000 people. Correct. Is that the total number of people who are dealing with kidney failure? Is that it? Or are, there's a lot more people who are opting for other solutions? Right. There are, are, people, are there, there only 100,000 people in the country that, that have kidney failure? Can't there, be, right? Right. Because there's, there's people that are different stages that they're not technically in kidney failure yet. They're more in have various kidney diseases. So what, what, how big of a problem is, is this? It's like I said, it's 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 huge. You know, there's there's many people, but only a hundred thousand people are at a point of deterioration that they qualify to join this list to wait for the next available kidney. Get to the back of the line. That's right. Someone who has kidney failure, and they're not going to get it from a cadaver. They get it from a, a living donor, which could be, I assume, a relative who'd be more inclined. I would imagine. Yes. Typically, around the country, people are, their only option is a relative or a close friend that's going to step up to the plate to donate to them. And even within Renewal's world, we we educate someone who's in need of a kidney, their family and friends, about kidney donation so that they could understand what it what it's like to donate a kidney. And a lot of times... The difference between someone donating and not donating is really education. So, so that's part of what you do. So e- even if someone is not going with y'all to try to get a kidney from your registry, like I said, the synergy people that you have at any time that are on your list that are in search of a altruistic kidney donor, living kidney donor, don't want to wait seven years to you know be half dead by then or worse. They want to get one right now so that they, that way they can resume life. Uh, but uh, even aside from that – you have you're educating people. You're telling them more about about what this entails, what it's all about. Yeah, I would say even more so. Uh, the ideal way of us helping somebody is by us reaching out to their family and friends. You know, I wish we had a freezer full of kidneys at any given time, but we don't. So sometimes we have events where someone, uh, fa- family and friends, come out to hear a presentation from Renewal about kidney donation. And a few people swab, and then someone do- from that group will end up donating their kidney, but there'll be some other people that had swabbed that will still consider donating to somebody else. So, But it all starts from education with family and friends and uh, the support we give them. So, so Johnny needs a kidney. He reaches out to Renewal. Renewal says, okay, let's get together. We're being a rabbi to Wurtz. And uh, he's going to tell us about kidney donations. And everyone there says, oh, wow, I really want to help. If I'm, if I'm a match, we'll talk more about that, what it means to be a match, right? If I'm a match, I want to maybe donate my kidney to my friend to save Johnny. And they all swab, right? Swab, I guess, is just like um, 
a little Q-tip in your mouth? Is that all mm-hmm. it takes? That's all it takes for that to part. find out if you're if you're a compatible match, right? Because not everyone's compatible. They're, these are not just commodities that are fungible, right? A hundred percent. There's a very very sophisticated matching uh, that happens at, at so it's the not next just stage. plug and play. No, nope. <laughs> you, you have to find the right match because it's I guess because it's so integrated in the system. It, it's really your kidney is for you. And to find someone who is bi, you know, biologically a, a match, or the, the same profile, effectively uh, the same kind of body, right? Is, is, am I describing this correctly? Yes. So a lot of times what we're going to do is if Johnny needs a kidney and he has someone who donates to him, who, who swapped for him, and then we have Bob who needs a kidney and he had somebody who swapped for him, but they don't match their intended recipient, we'll do a swap where – Bob's donor is going to give to Johnny, and Johnny's donor is going to give to Bob. So effectively, you're helping your friend. Each one, each person is helping their. You want to help your relative. You give him your kidney. You're just not a candidate. But there's a guy next door who also wants to help his relative, and he's not a candidate for his relative. But how about I give to him, or I gives one person gives to the other guy, and the other guy gives to the other guy, and effectively each one is bestowing a kidney upon their neighbor. That's right. That's really cool. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so so talk to me more about this. We have the education, we have these meetings, we have uh, this this swap. Talk to me more about about what y'all do. Okay, so we'll have an event, and actually, Yaakov, you might know, I just came from an event here. We had in Houston, Texas, we had an event uh, in someone's home. They hosted an event. A past, past kidney donor came, he spoke, and uh, we had a bunch of people came out and and did swab. It was beautiful, beautiful. We're just coming straight and they, from there. They swab. They want to. They want to join the registry. Yeah, they want to save a life. That's they want to save a life, and they're willing to potentially they're willing to actually just give the kidney to a stranger. Correct. So okay. The process of what we do is as follows. So we have, like we described, these events, and a lot of the event is really education. We have a question answer session. Usually, we bring a past donor. A lot of the uh, barrier to donation happens it comes from people thinking that you have to be some sort of superhero to donate. You have to it, that uh, you're in a lot of pain post donation for years. They think you have to change your lifestyle post donation, and really, a lot of that through education, through making these awareness events, that dispels a lot of those myths. So that's stage number one: education. The, education. Then all of the people who want to swab, we take those swabs and we send it out to a lab, and we have, I'd say, one of the most sophisticated systems in in our office. Uh, it's very, very cutting edge. It matches people. It takes all the results from the different swabbing, and it calculates based on the molecular level of someone. And tr- the goal is to find a very, very precise match on the DNA level where the body of the recipient essentially sees the kidney coming in when through the operation, and it recognizes it, is it almost as its own. And so that, we're looking for a precise match. We're looking for very precise. And we would estimate, like, if if we, if there's you know eight billion humans on this planet, there's a very very small number of people that would be a precise match for a given person. Is that right? Correct, correct. And thank God, because we have so many people who have potential donors, so many uh, so much ability to do the swaps, we're able to get a very very precise match on a molecular level. Nowadays. So they send in the swab, they put them through the cutting edge uh, system program to the molecular level, and we add it to a certain registry. And then and then you go through – so we have the donor registry and we have the need of recipient registry, and we see if this new swab actually you know hits a match. Is that right? That's correct. And after that point, if the match is good, someone from our office will call up the potential donor. You know, a lot of times people, we tell people, are you standing? Are you sitting? Sit down. We have some crazy news to tell you. You are a potential match to be a kidney donor. And that process is thrilling for people. It is scary for people. It is uh, something that they never expected uh, in their lifetime to have the opportunity to do this. And it definitely takes a lot of discussion, answering their questions, uh, support in order to get them to kidney donation. Uh, so that's, I guess, stage, sta- the second stage is after the matching is, is, is done. We do again, much more in-depth education with the potential donor about what, 
the process will look and like. And I assume the recipient is not told about this. The recipient actually only finds out like two, three weeks before the surgery. He doesn't want – you don't get the high hopes and the guy gets cold feet and uh, – right. So he, he doesn't know about this. He has no he clue. or she doesn't know about also, this. Also, a lot of times the donor is rejected because the – like I mentioned before, there's no medical benefit for the donor. There's an emotional benefit for the rest of his life. He feels great that he had the opportunity to do this, but there's no medical benefit. So the hospitals are very, very careful of who they take as a potential donor. So they reject donors all the time. The hospitals do? The hospitals, yeah. Why is that? Because if they feel that the donor is going to be at any elevated risk of developing something over the course of their lifetime because they donated a kidney or that they're at a higher level risk of developing kidney failure themselves, they won't take them. Because so the hospitals will reject. The donor wants to do it. The recipient's thrilled, but the hospital says, "No, this particular person, it's not fair to make him a donor because they will have an outsized elevated risk by doing this. They need to have both kidneys." Yeah, some people are born with everyone's born with two. Well, most people born with two kidneys, and most people will be fine if they give away one. This person, it's too much of an elevated risk. It's not fair to him. Yeah, or and her. actually, fifty percent of people are rejected. So fifty percent of people who swapped, and we have their detailed molecular information, and they matched, and then they go to the hospital, I guess, for for a battery of tests, right? Yeah. So that's actually the next step would be a battery of tests after they they match. This is all covered by the recipient's insurance, but they go in to the hospital for a full day of testing. It includes an EKG, a CAT scan, the chest X ray. You meet a nephrologist, you meet a surgeon, you meet a social worker, you meet a whole team of people to ensure that this is the right thing for you. So like you're describing, at that stage, a lot of people are rejected, not because they're not healthy, because they're not healthy enough to donate this without an elevated risk. And elevated risk, you know, we're talking about 5% elevated risk, we're talking about a significant elevated risk. Any elevated risk. Anything, anything. They're very conservative of who they take as a donor. Someone passes that. They still want to do it. So they've got the education. They've got the swab. They're really motivated. We'll talk more about the motivation a little bit because I want to kind of follow that uh, line of, uh, of of inquiry. They're interested. They got the swab. We have the information. We have a match. Okay, very exciting. Sit down. Uh, they go for a battery of tests. They're part of the 50% who qualify. What happens next? What happens next is they get a call. And they say... We say, you're a match. And I tell everybody that I call, I say, you should celebrate two things. Number one is that you have the ability to do something that very few people are going to have the ability in their entire life to save a, a life. And that ability is so empowering. It's, it's so beautiful. You, there's someone out there that's going to, please God, be able to live a, a rich and healthy life because of you. So that's one reason you should celebrate. Another reason you should celebrate is because you, if you passed all the testing, that means you're from the healthiest part of the population. So the top fifty percent, yeah, at yeah. Least. So celebrate that. Celebrate your health at the same time. Um, so after we have that conversation, typically transplant takes place four to six weeks later. You know, it's not so easy for the hospitals to schedule the transplant because you have to have two operating rooms, two surgeons, two separate teams that are available. So. This is called the scheduling nightmare of hospitals, trying to figure out how to get it all on the table. So it usually takes four to six weeks to get that scheduled. And I assume they're not necessarily geographically co-located, right? So you might have to bring the recipient or the donor. You know, they'll have to fly to get to the same hospital because they got to be side by side, really. Because you want you want you don't want the kidney outside of the body for very long, right? Yeah, tip, the ideal situation is that they should be in the same hospital. And that's one of the things that our organization does is that for the testing, for the transplant, we fly people in from around the world. We fly them in multiple times. We put them up at our hotel. We take care of their food and everything that they might need to make their process comfortable that we take care of. But yes, they're, they're coming into the same hospital side by side, one room. Uh, one room on this side, one room on that side, two people, one person saving a life, one person. I imagine life like being this saved. window in between where they they pull it out and they they pass the kidney <laughs> through the window. Don't drop it. Don't drop it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they just you know quickly uh, you know rewire it and all that. No, it's actually a half hour. For a half hour, it's out of the body because they have to clean up the kidney. They have to take off the extra fat that's around it. They have to open up the arteries to prepare it 
to go into the next body. So it does. It is outside the body for like a half hour. So we have this um, surgery. It's I assume it's a full day surgery. Is that right? It's around four or five hours. Four or five hours. Uh, it's a serious surgery. You're opening up both of their backs effectively. Uh, the the recipient might have a kidney there, just not working, right? So the recipient actually, this is I think the most the the fact that people find the most fascinating. They don't take out the old kidneys of keep the recipient. Keep it in there. They keep it in there. It's not causing any problems. They add on a third kidney. So they actually attach the kidney, not in the back, in the front. They just hook up another line uh, to the arteries that are... I guess I guess if, if it's not causing you any problems, you just remove it. I, unless maybe, I don't know if this is even possible, do people have cancer on the kidney? Is that a thing? They can have cancer. So on the you kidney, might want but, to just move but it, if it's, remove it's, it then. If it's very diseased and it's going to cause a problem, they'll take it out. But there's no need to in most cases. And is it simpler to put it up, put it in the front? Yeah, yeah. I guess there's, there's, there's less more piping, room. more piping. <laughs> okay, and then after that surgery, I guess they both have to convalesce, both have to recover. So what's that like? So for the donor, uh, the convalescent period will be around two, three weeks that before they could go back to full time work. During that period of time, they're not in so much pain after the first couple of days, but they're exhausted. Their body just needs to rest. Um, and the, the body has to adjust and say, okay, now we, we got only one of these. Yeah, it's like the, 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 the one happened? kidney that's in the do? body, like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> <laughs> and I got to take care of it, the whole body now. So it, it, it's kind of working. Even while you're sleeping, the body is, is, yeah. is adjusting. So it, it really, the, the, the main thing that people say during that time is, Fatigue, like they never thought they could possibly have. So it's not a I loved pain. it. You know, get we'll to get to your story. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to your story because you're not just someone who is on the sidelines. Uh, you have uh, a story. A story with that. So we we have the convalescence, and then I assume with the recipient, there is maybe a question as to whether or not the body's going to take to it. Right? Is that is that a is that a, a common concern that sometimes the body will reject it. I know that's the thing with uh, transplants often. Yeah, so the success rate of transplant is over 95%. So that means... Is that is that with your organization or in general? That's the general numbers. Our organization, because of the level of matching, we tend to have better results, but it's not 100%. There is a possibility of rejection. And then that person's really out of luck because the, the, the best person for them... They just got the kidney and it was rejected. Yeah, but uh, some of them have the opportunity to have another chance. And uh, obviously it's disheartening. A second to that four. <laughs> yeah, they have four kidneys. <laughs> just add more and more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a thing? It happens. It happens. It happens. happens. So if someone gets one kidney, for whatever reason it's rejected, um, they get another one if there's another altruistic donor. Correct. Wow. And then, and then I, is there some sort of follow up afterwards? Is there like, does your organization renewal, do they follow up with the, uh, with both parties? You know, like, do you have some sort of, you know, long term every six months, every, you know, three months, six months, 12 months, you know, three years, five years to kind of see how things are going? Yeah. So the ho- uh, hospitals do follow up. Um, the, the recipient is, is more of a patient. You know, th- there's somebody who, uh, they have an issue, and so they they have to be followed, monitored very carefully. But a kidney donor is essentially as good as new after he donates. So after the three weeks, you're back to playing tennis and back to full day working. No, that. no tennis yet because you can't exert yourself for six weeks. So most people go back to full uh, full time work two to three weeks after surgery. But another couple of weeks, they're still tired at night, and there there is still a recovery period after that. But sports and things like that, they they tip, they wait six weeks post surgery. They don't want to get a hernia, which is the most common complication. Complication. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk more about. I want to hear your story, but I want you to talk maybe in general about the motivation that someone would have to do this. All this entire your entire organization organization really relies on the goodness of people who, for for no medical benefit, like you said, no medical benefit, are willing to endure. The swab and the testing and the full battery of tests and the preparation and the travel and the inconvenience and the operation. And of course, there's risks. Anytime they, this is a general anesthesia, there's risks and the ele- the, the risk of elevate, even, even if you're part of 50%, that's the healthiest 50%, there's still a risk. And the, you know, the two weeks of lethargy, 
lethargy for our friends in the United Kingdom, and the six weeks of no tennis, and again, the, the fact that you had two and now you have only one. Why would people want to do that if there's no medical benefit? And they don't know the recipient, right? Because there's many times, I'm sure you have people that there's no motivation, they just want to be good, right? But they don't necessarily know any recipient. What are some of the motivations that people have? So I've asked this question to many donors. What was your motivation to donate? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the answers are similar. People just describe this very, very deep feeling that they've always felt that if only I would have the ability to save someone's life. It's this great yearning, I guess. Maybe it's coming from their soul that says that uh, this is something I'd love to do. They're doing it not out of uh, any any benefit like you described to themselves, but they're doing it just because there's a deep, innate desire of a person to be a giver, to be a nurturer, to, to give. You know, I'm a parent as well. You don't get much out of it, you know, you don't get, uh, you don't, get, there's no, there's no, uh, physical benefit that a parent has from having children, but the joy and the. Unless you employ them in like a sweatshop. <laughs> but, Not that I'm recommending that, of course. <laughs> but we all, anybody who has children knows that there's something so wonderful about being able to raise a child, to be able to give, give and give more to a child. And here's a way to actually give to somebody else in a very, very significant way. And, uh, people, uh, it, it touches them in a, in a very, very special way. And additionally, most donors that have donated said that they donated because they saw other people who are just like them who donated. They saw a doctor just like them who donated, a lawyer. They saw a mother just like them who donated. They saw people that, are, that they could relate to that donated. And they saw how these people, after they donated, were just elated from the entire process of donation. Which I will tell you, Donors to Torch have the same experience, but go on. <laughs> Proceed. <laughs> and they say, and the, and their friend comes back and says, I donated my kidney. Renewal was an unbelievable support. That's something we should get to. And uh, after a couple of weeks, I was as good as new. And I, I, I did this. And, 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 and people look at that and say, if he could do it, so could I. And we have this, this uh, I'd say, a kindness snowball that keeps growing and growing as more and more people are donating their kidneys. Most people by now in the community know one, two, three donors, and it becomes more normal in their mind. And they say, he did it, I could do it too. Well, if you think about it, donating blood, it's so common. It's routine where people give blood. And of course, you, you can't, can't give all your blood. You're in big trouble if you do that. And you can't give, I think, what, every six weeks or something like that. But people in general have a streak of benevolence to them to give something with no benefit. You don't know who's going to be the recipient of your blood. But every hospital in the world is stocked with all sorts of bloods from all the people who donated it. I guess part of it is, is a shift in, in people's understanding of what it's like and what it entails and how beneficial it is and what are the, what are the risks and to have a real – I know you don't do any shtick. You're not trying to trick people. No one's being tricked here. Everyone knows exactly what they're getting themselves into. And what the risks are, et cetera. But a lot of it is, is really, is really education. And like you said, empowerment. And once people see other people doing it and they, they see how excited people are and how meaningful it is where you literally have a part of your body that's now completely enlivening someone else. It's giving them life. Like then they no longer have to go to dialysis and they can live a life which they couldn't. Uh, before, before they had the, the transplant. So, the, you know, I, I imagine that, that that's, like I said, the snowball effect. I love the way you phrased that. But is there anything else that you heard? Yeah. People come to us with complaints. We hear this from every donor. After they go through the whole process, as they say, my biggest complaint or my biggest regret is that I can't do it again. Mm-hmm. This is so common because it touches people in a very, very special way to have done this. Yes. Talk to me about just your numbers. Like how many different donations did you facilitate? Did you as in your organization? How many, how many did you facilitate? We just celebrated the our thousandth transplant. Wow. One Bravo. thousand people whose lives have saved. We, that, we celebrated that around uh, three months ago. 
And we facilitated, thank God, since then around another 30 transplants. So uh, the numbers are off the charts. In fact, before I came out here to Houston, there was last week six transplants, six lives saved, six and again, mothers. And you're involved with each one of these transplants, right? You're speaking to the people, you're coordinating, and you're paying for a lot of the expenses, et cetera. Not me personally. We have a large staff, thank God. Uh, and some we, there's one person in our organization that does this outreach that goes to different communities around the country, Rabbi Josh Sturm. We have someone who's making uh, a flyer for anybody who's in need. They'll make social media posts to create flyers for them. There's somebody else in our organization, a few people that are making uh, these matches and speaking to potential donors. So it's really an army of people that are that this goes into. So it's not personally me, but I personally experienced many transplants and each one leaves me just so emotional seeing the goodness of people out there that are doing this. Amazing. If let's talk about your your story. Talk to me about what happened with you and how you ended up donating your kidney and what what happened as a result of that. So my story is that interestingly enough, I was early to a doctor's appointment in my hometown of Lakewood. I used to live in a town called Lakewood in New Jersey. And with as a father of a bunch of little kids, I'm never early to a doctor's appointment. I'm sitting there in my car waiting for the time for my appointment. And I look up and I see a sign that says, Renewal, come in and hear about kidney transplant. Now, my whole life, I've seen renewals, things out there in the newspapers of people in need of kidneys, but I always thought it was so crazy to do. I, I kind of pictured that if you donate your kidney, you're maimed for life, you have to change your whole lifestyle. I had all these preconceived notions that most people have before they donate a kidney. So in my mind, I was like, I'm never donating a kidney, but I'm early to this doctor's appointment. Let me go in and let me hear about it. So I go up to the presentation, and there's a few surgeons there, and I learned some two main things that changed my perception. Number one is that a kidney donor after surgery, after the recovery period, lives a regular healthy lifestyle, regular healthy life. They don't have restrictions in diet. They could do anything that they've done before, before they donated. Nothing changes, essentially. Also, I learned what it does for a recipient. I wasn't aware that recipient, that people in need of a kidney are essentially dying a slow death. And through transplant, they could go back to a regular healthy life. They could, if it's a mom, she could go back to raising her family. If it's a dad, he could go back to work. The thing that is so beautiful about this is through one donation, you could impact the whole community. Each person has so many connections that rely on them. And if you donate, you could uh, take that whole uh, system around them and, and really transfer it. It's just affecting one person with one illness. It's their family. It's the community. It's changing everything. Oh, yeah. So that's so you hear about that. You, you go to this meeting. It's like, I, I imagine it like a, like a Las Vegas timeshare. They're trying to sell you on something. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not at all. I actually said <laughs> renewal does not sell people on it. They actually, a lot of people accuse renewal of why are you turning me away? Why are you trying to not encourage me? Because at renewal, they're very much into it's not for everybody. You yes. You really want to do it. And there's no guilt in saying it's not for me. So you, you hear this presentation, whatever it is, a few minutes, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever it is. And you say, okay, I'll, I'll get swapped. It's, I'll swab. And this is when? Do you remember what this is? This is in 2015. I'm when gonna... was Renewal founded? Renewal was founded in 2007. And I want to tell you something very interesting. Renewal was founded by someone, Mendy Reiner. Mm-hmm. And the goal of the organization was to do two transplants a year. That was the plan. That was the plan. And that's a beautiful plan. Open an organization, save two lives. And uh, we're well on track to be doing around three transplants in, on an average week Amazing. this past year. Amazing. So you go in 2015, Renewal's been around for eight years. You hear the presentation. You get swabbed right then and there. Yeah, back then it was a blood test, but... Uh, you get yeah. a blood test. Okay, it's, just, it's, it's a little bit less invasive today. You're like, okay, I'll give a blood test. You give a blood sample and you forget about it. You go back to your appointment. You go back to your bustling home. And then what happens? Correct. So then four years later, I got a call 
that I was a match to a 33-year-old mother from Boston, a mother of three children. They don't give you, obviously, all the details, right? Because they don't want you to go extort them and say, I'll sell you my kidney for a million dollars, right? There, there's a lot of You don't privacy. know who it is. You just know some basic demographics basic of, profile. Of, your, of your recipient. So you get a call from Renewal. Uh, hey, Rabbi Dewartz, this is uh, Joe from Renewal. Uh, you might have forgotten, but you uh, gave a little blood sample many years ago. Turns out we have someone who reached out to us. They're in need of a, of a kidney, and you're a perfect match, or you're a match. Correct. So I went through the process that we already described, but I want to share with you something unique about my story, is that we get to the morning of the transplant. So you went through the whole thing, the battery of tests and all that, and you're just doing it because you're such a swell guy. Huh. <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... Morning of the transplant, go ahead. Morning of the transplant. Obviously, I was curious who the recipient is. You Renewal keeps the donor and recipient separate till usually six weeks post-surgery. So you don't really know who it is, okay. even when you're donating. But the coordinator from Renewal, Menachem Friedman, mm-hmm. comes over to me with a stack of letters. And it was letters from my recipient and her children that wrote letters to me because I, I'm not meeting her. So they wanted to express their things to me in the letters. And the morning of the surgery, I was just too emotional to even be able to read the letters. I looked at the letters. It was kind of the first sign of life from the other side. So just seeing the actual tangible letters, I, I got all teary-eyed. So I put them away. It wasn't the right time. And then two days later, when I was experiencing significant pain and I needed a pick-me-up, I asked my wife if I could see those letters. She takes them out. And they were all beautiful. But I'll tell you what was in the one that touched me the most. It was from my recipient's son, David. And he wrote in big letters, just like kids write. He wrote the following. He said, hi, my name is David. I'm 12 years old. In one year from now is my bar mitzvah. Thanks to you, my mommy will be alive for my bar mitzvah. Those words just hit me like a ton of bricks. I, you know, obviously very, very emotional to see just, there's just a little boy who wants his mommy. That's when it really hit me. The power of what I just had the opportunity to do is that I had that opportunity to help a boy who just needs his mommy and a a husband who needs his wife, a community who needs uh, this woman. And just to finish up that little story is that I donated on the Jewish calendar on Rosh Chodesh, Nisan, that's two weeks before Passover. Till today, my wife claims I only donated a kidney to get out of Passover (laughs) cleaning. (laughs) We're still litigating that one. (laughs) Both are painful. (laughs) Which one's more? I don't know. But essentially, I got 11 months later in the mail a invitation to this boy's bar mitzvah. So I guess you got to meet the that family and that woman and her family and her children. Yes, we met in between. She came to our... I, I assume they both have to opt in. Is that right? If they want, if they want to refuse to... I guess you can't really reclaim it back, right? Correct. <laughs> so not much... You don't really have much leverage and you ain't giving your other kidney, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but if you both opt in, then you can meet each other. So you have to meet, meet each other. I assume you befriended them. Yes. My wife became very close with her um, and uh, we... A couple of months later, got a after we after we met, we got an invitation to this David's bar mitzvah, and something really in Boston nice is we opened up the invitation, and we look at this invitation, and the date was Rosh Chodesh Nisan, wow, exactly, exactly a year to, later. to the day a year later, and we went and it was magnificent. Obviously, you see this kid with his mother interacting with his mother. It just it, there's there's no words. And to you're the it. celebrity, right? You're the you're the kitty dunner. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. That's not what I was there for. I was there to just uh, well, do you, take the well, nachos. Question, do you remember what happened the night before you went to the surgery? Who came to visit you? Yes, Yaakov Wolf. That's came right. To visit me. That's right. He did. I forgot about that with Dan Coleman. That's from, right. From, we came to visit. Torch. That's and right. I, I don't know if you know what happened to our side of the story. We came to visit. And um, we spent some time with you in in your home in uh, Marlboro, New Jersey. 
and um, and then we left, and it's like a twenty five mile an hour zone, and Dan was driving, and he went like forty, okay, and he got stopped. So the cop behind him is I was in the front seat. Cop behind him st- stopped him because we were speeding. So the cop pulls up, and I'm from the front seat, right? I start talking. I say, um, officer, we just came back from my friend who's going in tomorrow to be an altruistic kidney donation. Remember this line I said, in the spirit of altruism, would you kindly let us go? And he's like, okay, sure. <laughs> so you saved us from a speedy thing. You know that story? Did I tell you that? Yes, yes. You <laughs> did tell you. Okay. But honestly, I remember had- the spirit of altruism. <laughs> so in the spirit of altruism, would you kindly uh, let us go? And he's like, okay, fine. You know, in order to increase the the awareness of kidney donation, we actually give a, a bumper sticker that we encourage all kidney donors to put on the back of their car that says, I am a kidney donor. And, uh, a few people have told us that it actually got them out of a ticket. You know, people have said the cop has seen that. You know, that but that's not the reason to donate a kidney. Do people give the right versus the left? Is it the same? It's typically the left kidney. The only reason is it's all the same, but they really there's really a longer artery that comes out of the left kidney, so it's better for the plumbing on the recipient end. It's easier for them to attach it. So I would imagine also equal, if there's that. a risk of you know when we drive on the left side, if there's there have been any impact that can maybe damage the kidney, it's better to give with the left one. I, I haven't heard said that, that one. But. Okay, well, okay, you heard it here first. <laughs> I'm asking you a different question. Do you have any people who are donors who don't want anyone to know about them, about, about that, who want to be, who don't want a bumper sticker, who don't want any publicity at all? Is that a thing? There are definitely some that do want that and we're very, very respectful of that. Um, we do encourage people to share. Like I described to you before, very few people donate in a vacuum. They have to see other donors. And when they see people that they can relate to, it awakens that desire to donate in many of the donors. So we totally respect if someone wants to be anonymous, we will protect that with our, our lives. You know, No one will find out. But we do encourage people to share. And not because they want to try to be haughty or any reason like that. Because it really... By sharing your story, saves more lives. Talk to me more about, we heard your story. We got saved from the speeding ticket. You met this family. I, I, I gather you're still friendly with them. Yes. You feel amazing. You don't regret it, right? No, not at all. I don't have a bad day anymore. <laughs> so what was that process like? So you up to have donated a kidney, but now you work for the organization. You actually run it. You're the director. Is that right? I'm the director, yes. So how, what happened there? I guess you got involved? Yeah. So I just went back to my regular life after I donated. And like everybody else that donates, it becomes a major part of their life. It's a, something that just stays with you. And in fact, every, pretty much all kidney donors ask us afterwards, how can I help help you further the cause can I come and, and volunteer to visit past donors? Can I come s- support past donors? Whatever you need, I'm here to help you. And we have like by now an army of kidney donors who want to help. So I kind of, I offered renewal. I said I could speak. If you ever have an event that you want a past donor to speak by, I'd be happy to speak there. Renewal had a big event in Baltimore. Uh, I went with a few of the staff at Renewal. We took an Amtrak, went to Baltimore. Around 500 people showed up at that event. And you're just a volunteer. I'm just a volunteer. I'm going to help you guys out and go back to my regular life. And um, a couple years later, Renewal was expanding, and it's expanded many times since then. Uh, They give me a call, and they said, we're expanding, and we think you'd be great for the job as a support person for kidney donors. And that's how I started at Renewal and something I do till today. And uh, we think you'd be the right guy. And getting that call that, that I'd have the opportunity to not just volunteer, but experience this magic day in, day out is something that I never dreamt of. And it's it's been a blessing from that day until today to be able to help other donors go through the process. There's not, there's nothing greater. And you come, it comes Shabbos and you have that feeling of, supporting two, three donors, having a small part in 
two, three lives saved why, every why, single why, week why, is amazing. Why, why, why are we being so modest? Why small parts? If not for renewal, it wouldn't happen. So, like this past week, how many? Like in the past month, you said there was. Um, you said you had. We had one week where it had six donations. So six lives that you saved because you run renewal, and renewal does things that facilitate that. And it wouldn't happen otherwise, right? Yeah, but we love to give the donor the most credit. Of course, so. of course, the donor gives the most credit. Gets the most credit. Yes, uh, it definitely would not happen without renewal. From the education, from the support, from the follow up. Plus, you're paying for a lot of things, right? Because the, the donor knows, like, you know, if you have wages that miss, like, what are some of the things that you cover? I know you, you yeah. mentioned that wages that you miss, or flights, or what? What? what what's it like? What else do you do besides for the counseling and the guidance, the coordination, the facilitation? Okay, so uh, all of the medical part of it is covered by the recipient's insurance, like I said, but there's a lot of other expenses. The expenses start from those swapping events. Uh, which have, uh, you know, the swabs cost us a lot of money to, to process those. But essentially in support of the donor, like you just mentioned, people are out of work for three to six weeks. We cover people's lost wages. We'll fly people around the country to donate. We'll put them up in a hotel. We'll cover the cleaning help in their home while they recover. They should, their house should be immaculate. If they need any extra babysitting, we'll cover that too. We'll cover the, uh, food for the home. We encourage people to not cook or their spouse shouldn't cook the first two weeks after surgery. Really, they should be focused on taking care of the donor. So we'll cover all that. Uh, in fact, the cost to renewal for every single transplant is over $18,000 because we're really encourage the donor that anything that they possibly could need to make the process more seamless, more pleasant, uh, we encourage them to take that. In fact, my kids, after I donated, you know, they had pizza, ice cream, uh, Chinese food that week. <laughs> they say, "Could you donate your kidney every week?" You know, they they, they loved it. That's that's very beautiful. But I, I think more than just the the money, it's it's the awareness and it's the actual facilitation to actually say, "Okay, you might be a candidate. You might be a candidate. Let's put these people together and let's figure out." Because you know, the I assume the medical expenses are much more than. Eighteen thousand dollars, you know, yeah. two stitches in America is like what? It's like thirty grand, it's a few hundred thousand dollars. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars, yes, for the medical, but that's covered by the insurance, right? right? But your part is, I think, the amount of money that that you actually have to invest is in every transplant is 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 minuscule compared to what you're actually doing to to you know to bring the parties together. Correct. In fact, we actually have to sometimes encourage donors to take the lost wages and take all that. They say, I'll take my sick days. I'll, I'll take this. We say, those things are for you. We want to help you for, you donate. And kidney donors, by and large, are very, very giving people. And they don't like to take. Yeah. And we kind of have to educate them that taking this money to make this process more pleasant is not taking. It's part of the giving is to take this uh, Yeah financial reimbursement beautiful give me some stories of kidney donations facilitated by renewal over the years let's talk i guess at the beginning like would we have some stories like some founding episodes of of kidney donations that kind of got renewal you know we were, we were supposed to do you know two a year but what were some of the stories that got started? What, is, what are some of the stories that's, that stand out? What are some stories that really remind you about what you're doing and the lives that you're saving? Okay. So I'll give you the background story, how it all got started, and I'll, then I'll give you some of the stories that really touched me. And re- literally every day is a beautiful story, so it's hard to choose, but here we go. So the background story is – like I described, there's Mendy Reiner is the founder of Renewal. And he was a businessman. He never thought kidneys would be anything part of his life. One day, someone came over to him in synagogue, in the shul, and that person looked looked pale, his coloring was off, and he said, I need help. So Mendy Reiner, who is a wonderful person, uh, takes out money. He thought he needed a, a donation. And the guy said, no, I don't need a donation. Uh, I need a kidney. I'm, I'm slowly dying a slow death because I need a kidney transplant. So this kind-hearted Mendy Reiner didn't know anything about it, but he figured, let me put an ad in the Jewish newspaper and see if anybody would be really willing to donate a kidney. He put an ad in the newspaper and he expected like no one would reach out. But essentially 10 people 
reached out that they would be interested in kidney donation. He discovered a spark of the goodness and the kindness of the Jewish community, that they're such a giving people, and uh, he touched upon something. So he didn't even know at that point if it was safe. He didn't know anything. He didn't know, but he but he's, he's just, not a kidney expert. He's not a kidney expert. He didn't know essentially what the kidneys did. He had a yeshiva education, <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted to help. So he put it in the ad in the newspaper. People respond, and he didn't know what to do with that. Okay, as the response, but what should he do? So he reached out to somebody by the name of Sandy Ornstein. Sandy Ornstein is a uh, person who sees an issue, sees uh, a void that needs to be filled, and he create, created multiple organizations. A go-getter. He's a go-getter. He, he, there's some of the, his organizations are Relief, that's mental health referrals, Refua, that's, uh, that's medical referrals, and a host of other organizations that he has started, Premium Health, which is a huge medical clinic, and essentially Mendy Reiner comes over to Sandy Ornstein and he says, I have this idea, I don't know what to do with it. People responded, help me start this. So Sandy Ornstein essentially put, did a lot of research and he, uh, he, he helped build the organization. He hired someone, Rabbi Chaim Steinmetz, to be the original director of Renewal, and they were up and running. Like I described before, the goal was to do two transplants a year. Did they find that guy a kidney? They found that guy a kidney. The original and, guy? Yes, yes. And he's still with us? That I don't know. Um, if he if he's listening to the podcast, send us an email, <laughs> rabbiwalbachina.com, let us know how things are going. So we've, they found him a kidney. We have these 10, these 10 donors. They're now joining the registry of this nascent organization, Renewal. Yeah. Calling it a registry would be would be like an overstatement at this point. They just had names. They didn't know what to do with it. And um, really, when they started out, it was greeted with a lot of skepticism. People out there never heard of such a thing, of someone donating a kidney to someone that they don't know. So they were concerned. Was there money being paid to these people? I remember hearing that there's only one country in the world where you're allowed to sell your kidneys for money. The Islamic Republic of Iran. That's what I was told. Is that true? Correct. It's, <laughs> it's, true. Hi- it's highly illegal to get even a dollar from donating a kidney. So, uh, yes. Okay. This, this e- was definitely a concern. Even though I remember hearing some podcasts arguing that it's actually a good idea to allow a market, but that's a separate subject. That's we're, a separate subject. We're, we're dealing yeah. with the, within the we're, rules. We're 100%. dealing within the rules, yeah. So, uh, people were very skeptical. The hospitals were skeptical. It took a lot of meeting and discussing and until the hospitals realized that this is the real deal. These... Renewal is really there to facilitate just goodness. And uh, people, I, I sometimes describe to people that have a hard time wrapping their brains around this concept of people cutting themselves open for a total stranger. I say, I understand why it's hard for you to picture this, but come to my community. You go into any large Jewish community. There's a volunteer ambulance called Hatzalah. They're, they'll drop everything in the middle of the night, in the middle of their child's wedding to, to respond to a call. If you get a flat tire, there's an organization called Haverim that will change your tire. They'll change, they'll take care of your, your, your heater in the middle of the night if it goes out. If you run out of formula in the middle of the night, there's something called the Gemach that will have formula for your child. Every aspect, aspect of Jewish life in these large Jewish communities have an organization that's there, people giving of their time, of their energies, of their money to help someone. I have a story about this. So Houston now, our community, we have a hot salon, the volunteer EM, EM, EMT that you mentioned. And we have a chaveirim, which is the volunteer. I'll fix your flat for free, which I have utilized their services a few times. But about uh, three, four years ago, before we had this organization, I was in New York with my parents for Pesach. And I swapped vans, okay, with your sister. Not your sister, it was my sister in law. One of your other sisters. She was coming to Houston. We're going we're going to New York. We're there for Pesach, they're here for Pesach. We swap vans. And then um it was the day before Pesach, which is the busiest day of the year for everyone. And uh, I get a flat in her Honda Odyssey. Oh my! Don't don't ask me to borrow my 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 car. So I say, I call them up. I say, well, I don't know. I should call my Geico because it's my Geico, and and well, do you have your Geico? I'm trying to figure out what to do because I would just call my Geico, right? This is not an ad for Geico. 
he's like, call Haverim. I'm like, I forgot. I'm in New York here. So I call Haverim. And two minutes later, this nice Hasidic guy in a very large black Escalade shows up, pulls out the, uh, the, the, the nail that was in my, um, that was in my tire, his tire, fills it up, you know, plugs it, f- pump, pumps it up with air and leaves. But I was like so excited about this. Wow. What an incredible service. And I, 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 I said to him, when I actually got in touch with them, it was, it was really after the, the, the yumped of this, the festival. So it was the night afterwards or two nights afterwards. But I had said to him, tell me what it was like Erev Pesach, the day before Pesach. What was it like? So he said, in the Mansi Haverim, we had 147 calls, 147 calls in one city. And this is completely voluntary. They don't charge you money. You can pay them if you wanted to. They'll just do it for free. So there's a, there really is a spirit of kindness, of generosity, of hospitality uh, in our communities. And we're fortunate to have that. But you're saying we have that for all these other things. Why not this as well? Yeah. This, this past Shabbos, I was in the Houston community. Someone who I never met before hosted us for Shabbos. This is, yeah, it's beautiful. This is just part of our, our and listen, our you know, we're reading about Abraham and the parasha. Abraham is all about kindness. You read the kindness that Abraham does. It's superlative kindness where he's people, strangers, just know who they are. And they're idolaters. They stand up for everything that he rejects. He makes them wash their feet because they worship the dust in their feet. And he runs and he's running even though he himself is so old and, you know, only three days removed from a circumcision. It's an incredible story. Genesis chapter 18. It's a beautiful story. And this is part of our bones. The Talmud says that our nation, we have an inherent, innate quality of benevolence, of kindness. And I, and, I, and this is maybe the prime example. People are willing to undergo a surgery and it's inconvenient and it's painful because you're recovering for, from a surgery. And yes, it's not detrimental, as we know. But of course, there's always risks. Again, I'm doing all your disclaimers for you. But people want to do that and they're happy about it and they've become advocates for it. And there's no greater display of this nation that we are so fortunate to be part of. And what we stand for is a really beautiful thing. It is. Can I share with you a crazy st- statistic? Let's go. Let's go. Okay. What percentage of America are Jewish? I think it's around 2%. It is around 2%. Most of Renewal's donations come from the Orthodox Jewish community. Okay. And the Orthodox Jewish community represents 0.2% of the population so like of the ten, United like States. So like 10% of American Jews are Orthodox. Okay. And that 0.2% is responsible for 18% of all altruistic kidney donations across the United States. Wow. Which is a mind-boggling number. It's a staggering number. number. Staggering. One of every five, you're telling me, around, every five altruistic kidney donors in this country is an Orthodox Jew. Yep. God bless these Orthodox Jews. (laughs) Yeah. The number is in New York, New Jersey, around over 50%. Over, well, oh, that's because there's a very high concentration of Orthodox Jews there, obviously. Correct. So half of the altruistic kidney donations done in New York, New Jersey, tri state area are done by Orthodox Jews. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. Are there other communities that are also exemplify this spirit of altruism? Well, Renewal has been involved with trying to get other communities set up to be able to do this. And uh, one of the, our most successful ventures has been setting up an organization called Dove. And it's like model... Like the soap. Yeah, like the soap, but it's really for veterans, to donate to veterans. Uh, it's not not, not Jewish. Um, and Renew will give the seed money, and we advise them. And they thank God facilitated over 20 transplants at this Beautiful. point. Beautiful. Wow. That's nice. Yeah. We're, we'd love to and have, obviously be able to every, set- everyone benefits, right? Because we have more, more life and more vibrancy, more vitality. And we don't, it's a terrible thing when someone dies of kidney failure because maybe there's someone who would be willing to do it. And again, without pressuring them to, to donate, but creating the infrastructure that can facilitate that. Yeah. Our goal and our dream at Renewal is to facilitate, to set up Renewal-like organizations and Many different communities. We'd love to have one for police officers to donate to police officers. We'd love to have firemen for firemen. Because we've found that renewal, uh, one of the 
things that we've discovered is that very few people are willing to donate to just like a bucket. An absolute they have stranger. no uh, relationship with the recipient. We have to find some commonality between the donor and recipient. We've been able to create that within the Jewish community, and um, therefore we and we hope that other communities have that ability to connect with each other and donate kidneys. That's a beautiful, beautiful idea. Give me some more stories uh, from your time at, at at Renewal. So some stories that jump out to, to me are as follows. Um, I'd like to share with you the story of Rabbi Rothwax. He's a rabbi in Teaneck, New Jersey. And there was someone in the community that was in need of a kidney. And Rabbi Rothwax was approached to uh, to spearhead a campaign, uh, an event in the community for this particular individual. So Rabbi Rothwax started to do his research. And he came back to renewal and he said, this doesn't make sense to me. I can't make an event in my community and I'm not willing to do it. So I'm going to actually, I did some of my own research and I'd like to donate a kidney myself. So because he wanted to make an event in his community, he decided to donate it himself. And what I'd like to share with you is something that he told us afterwards. He showed us a letter from his daughter. He has a teenage daughter, and like all of us, we have teenagers in our home. Teenagers don't always listen to what we have to say. And always, ever. Or ever. <laughs> <laughs> and his daughter wrote to her father. She said, you know, you've always told me this is the right way to do this, this is the right way to do that. And like all uh, teenagers, I rolled my eyes and just moved on with it. She said, it all changed once you donated your kidney. I saw that you don't just talk the talk, but you walk the walk as well. And now I see you really mean what you say. And that kind of shifted the dynamics in their relationship uh, forever. It's a beautiful thing. You know, you talk about the, the, the generalized spirit of kindness and benevolence and, and altruism in our community. I'm thinking about what the Talmud says that if you save a life, you save a, you save your fellow Jewish brother or sister. It's like you save the whole world. And the fact that we do see such an overwhelming outpouring of people that want to do this, it does mean that we're not just talking to talk, we're not just preaching. We collectively as, as a nation, we, we actually we actually believe it. We actually live by this ideal. You know, with everything going on in the world right now, in Israel, one of the th- things that we heard from our enemies is they some one of the news outlets was interviewing someone from Hamas. And they said, the Jews, they celebrate life. We celebrate death. And that's true. We, we celebrate life. And we want everyone to have the greatest possibility of having a full and healthy life. I'd like to share with you another story. How's that? Let's go. All right. This is with someone by the name of Shmuley Abramson. He's a kidney donor from Baltimore. Shmuley, when he was younger, he had a brain tumor. And thank God he was he, he got over it. He beat the cancer. And uh, he called up Renewal a bunch of years later. He's already in his 20s. He said, I want to donate a kidney. And we're going through his medical background with him. And we see brain tumor. And most people that have brain tumor won't qualify to be a donor. But he said, I'd love to start the process. Let the hospital decide if I'm a candidate or not. Well, he's been in remission for that many years. That technically, he could be a kidney donor, but... We were kind of thinking he's never going to make it through the process. Well, anyhow, he starts the, the testing, and they made him jump through hoops because of his medical background. He kept coming again to New York from Baltimore, and thank God he cleared. The morning of the surgery, I was there in the pre-op area with him, and Shmuley's been through a lot to get to this day. And his surgeon, Dr. Sultan, comes into the room, and... Shmuley says, hi, nice to meet you, Dr. Sultan. Dr. Sultan is wearing a kippah. He's part of the Orthodox Jewish community. He's a transplant surgeon. And 
Shmuley said, I have a question. Are you related to David Sultan? He says, yeah, that's my younger brother. I see Shmuley's eyes start filling with tears. I'm looking, I, I don't know exactly understand what's going on. And Shmuley starts to scroll through his phone and he finds a picture. He takes out a picture of himself, Shmuley, as a young boy in Camp Simcha, sitting right next to David Sultan. He said, your younger brother was fighting cancer the same time as me. And we were both in Camp Simcha together. And we encouraged each other. And he says, you know my motivation to donate? Why did I jump through these hoops? Why did I overturn my life for weeks in order to donate? He said, I wanted to save a life because my life was saved so many years ago through the kindness and the, the expertise of the surgeons and the, and the medical professionals who saved my life. And I wanted to save somebody else's life. He said, this is amazing. My motivation to donate was because of my illness that I beat. And now my surgeon walks into the room and he's the brother of the boy who helped support me when I was going through my own illness. And today you're the one who's facilitating my transplant. That was a beautiful moment to see that in front of my very own eyes. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Any other stories you want to share? I'll share one more. One more, okay. So a lot of our donors are actually from the Hasidic community. The Hasidic community, when it comes to kindness, chesed, there's no one that matches them. And I was with a donor by the name of Burich. He was from New Square. And what happened was that they started the transplant, and uh, Burich, uh, they got to the kidney. They the, the way it works with the kidney transplant is that they bring in the donor first, they cut till the kidney, but then they pause right there and then because they want to make sure everything's okay on the donor's end. Then they bring in the recipient to the operating room right next door. They start their surgery. And when they see everything is good on the recipient's end, then they on, and only then do they remove the kidney. So they start the surgery with Boruch. They get till the kidney. They stop. They go to the recipient. And something that's very rare is that they see at that point that the recipient would not be able to have a kidney transplant. There was something medically wrong with the recipient that they weren't able to pick up on the scans, and they essentially had to abort the surgery. And it was my job now to go into the recovery room where Burich was recovering from surgery and share with him the news... You still have two kidneys. That you still have two kidneys. <laughs> you know, it's all good, you're healthy, but... And he just went through a major surgery, and... He, and it's equally as invasive? Pretty much. You know, they've, they've, they've done a lot of cutting till, uh, till that point. So I'm there, all the surgeons are standing around, and his eyes flutter open. Good news and bad news. <laughs> good news and bad news, exactly. <laughs> good news is everyone's okay. Bad news is that you, the surgery had to be aborted. You still have your kidneys. And I see like a tear forming in his eye. You know, obviously disappointed he went through all this. And, and he said, can I donate in the future? So the surgeon says, technically yes, but once in two weeks from now, you're going to have scar tissue that's going to form around the, the area where we cut. And that once that scar tissue forms, we can't donate, we, you can't donate ever again because it would be just too complicated of a surgery to, to, to make you go through this again once you form scar tissue. So I'm looking at this Burich and I see him thinking. He's like, so can I donate again within two weeks? I'm <laughs> thinking, oh my goodness. This guy just went through all of this, and all he's thinking is, if I have two weeks to, weeks to donate, renewal, find me a recipient within two weeks. And we did. Wow. <laughs> and Burich just 
days after going through a major surgery, went into surgery again, and thank God this surgery was successful, and he donated. Just seeing the strength of character, the strength of the nobility of this this Burich, who, uh, you know, who who just thinking about somebody else. He wasn't wallowing in his own pain. He wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, wasn't self pitying himself that he just went through all that. He just wanted to save a life. I. I, I was just. Oh, that is a beautiful story. Wow, unbelievable. Like I said, it's just a great privilege to be part of this nation, don't you think? Like, you probably feel like that very often. Yes, yes. It's uh, it's I like I tell my wife every week. I say, first of all, the opportunity that I have to donate a kidney, I I just feel great at the end Even of the week. It's been it's been years. What four years now since then? Yeah, but you you have, still feel great. I still feel great. I feel like I have you a hard up, time. You keep up with the recipient. Uh, we do, we do. We go to their summer. They doing? came to our to, to ours. Everything's fine. Yeah, we went to visit them in the summer. They came for a Shabbos. It's beautiful. Wow. But uh, like I say, it's hard to have a bad day when you know somebody else is having a good day because of you. Yes. I remember reading, I know this is probably not, I should be speculating the podcast, but I remember reading that the recipients of transplants start to adopt some of the personality of the donor. Is that a thing? I know it's probably way out of way out of your your field of, of expertise. So, but no is, uh, is is Miss recipient? Is she now super sharp and super handsome? And <laughs> so, I actually, interestingly enough, there's no medical literature that says this, but I've anecdotally heard many cases like this of people asking that. And in fact, my my recipient's husband, who's a doctor himself. Calls me, calls me up, and he says, "Just curious, do you like chicken?" I said, "Chicken." He said, "I said I I like it, but is is it my favorite food? I'd rather a nice steak, but chicken's great." He said, "Because before my wife's transplant, she hated chicken. She couldn't be in the same room as chicken. She, the smell bothered her, and everything like that." And she said, "Now she loves chicken." <laughs> So I don't know from a medical perspective, but it certainly seems like it. Wow, that's uh, that's a that's a cool story. I like that. That to me is uh, it's anecdotal, but that to me is persuasive. So talk, talk to me about um, if someone's listening to the podcast and they maybe want to consider potentially to be part of this cohort of heroes that say. If I can save a life, if I can save a brother or a sister whose life is teetering on the brink of maybe death or misery or, or suffering, and I could do it with some disruptions, but mostly minimal disruptions, and I, w- I want to get involved. I want to get my community involved. I want to hear from from you. What can they do to learn more? So, of course, everyone, I think it's important for everyone to know about this. Just to know where we come from and to know what we stand for and to know how special our nation is and how wonderful the people of our people are and to know that people are really living these ideals. It's not just things that we preach. But if someone wants to actually practically get involved, they want, they, they say, I too want to be like Rabbi Moshe Goritz. I want to donate my kidney or potentially see if I'm a candidate. I want to get my community involved. What are some things that they can do that you can help facilitate? Well, certainly they should check out our website, which is www.renewal.org. Um, there's a lot of educational material on that website. And from that website, you could have the ability to request a, fill out a form and request a swab kit. And we would mail that swab kit to your home. Very easy. Comes back to us in the mail. And then you go into the database. As far as an event, if there's any community out there, anywhere in the USA or even uh, Australia, South Africa, where we do transplants there as well, uh, that wants to create an awareness event in their community, they could reach out to us. We have an outreach person. His name is Rabbi Josh Sturm. That's all he does. He goes out to different communities and raises awareness about kidney donation. We'd be happy to send someone out. Uh, sometimes we have schools that want to that have a chesed day a day of, where they want to highlight different chesed that goes on in chesed the community is kindness yes um so they sometimes reach out to us and uh we will be happy to do a zoom 
and educate the kids. We'll even send them some squishy kidneys. What's the, <laughs> what is the minimum age to donate if someone wants to donate? You have to be 18? You have to be 18 by law, but renewal doesn't accept donors under 21. 21. Just because you want to be a, above the standard of the law. Correct. We want people even to be for a family for a family member. I guess for a family member, they wouldn't really need you so much, right? No, that actually. I'm glad you brought that up. Even people that have a family member who wants to donate, they should reach out to us because, again, we have the ability sometimes to find a better match, and we could do that swap. But even a family member who wants to donate, it's so confusing and so daunting. Uh, to donate a kidney. You're really the experts. You're the experts in this thing. So we'll, and we'll support even someone who's donating to a brother. We'll support them the same way. We'll hold their hand through the process. And that sometimes is the difference between someone who ends up donating and someone who gets cold feet in the end. So even if you do have a potential donor out there, they should contact us. Mm -hmm. So we have the uh, education. We have outreach. They should reach out to the website. Uh, renewal.org, reach out to Rabbi Josh that you mentioned. Um, and maybe, hopefully, you know, this podcast will raise more awareness. I think even if someone's not going to go ahead with it, not even to, to pursue it, I think it's an amazing story because it's really a story about the wonders of our people and our nation. And, you know, we get a lot of flack. People say, you know, people complain and they say, you know, these are nice high ideals, but, you know, I've seen some Jews and even religious Orthodox Jews that did things maybe they were improper. And, and of course, we're not going to defend the indefensible. We never do that. But it's important to know that a huge percentage of the kidney donors, the altruistic kidney donors, which is almost like the peak of altruism in this country, come from people that live by the Torah ideals. And they're, and they're willing to say, I stand by what the Torah says. The Torah says to do these kinds of things. And I hereby, I hereby submit to those rules. So that even that, I think, is very beneficial for people to know. That's an important story to, to publicize. People should know that the, the people really live by these values. But hopefully, there are going to be people who listen, who, uh, who, who are moved by these stories and have a spirit of, of altruism as well. And maybe they'll reach out, and who knows what will happen. And I would say that even if somebody hears this story and hears what is happening here, this amazing thing that's happening within our community, and they're not ready to donate, because truth be told, it's not for everybody. Some people are a little... Uh, skittish. Skittish, that's <laughs> the good word. And they're not donating a kidney. But hopefully it inspires you to do something more for somebody else. Everybody could do something, whether it's donate more charity, whether it's cooking meal for people that are in, are in need, whether it's getting involved in your local, um, visiting the sick. Everyone should take what you've heard today and in the, your own be life. Be inspired to be more benevolent and kind. And I, you mentioned earlier the war that's happening in Gaza as you recall, I reminded you of a Shabbos. You and I spent the Shabbos in Gaza. Yes. When we were in Yeshiva together, this was before the unilateral disengagement from Gaza in 2005. The last Shabbos before the, the, the disengagement, we were in Yeshiva in Israel. I don't remember how it all happened, but we, we spent a Shabbos. And you and I in Gaza, we still have some pictures. We did. It was magnificent. It was Amazing. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful yes. Shabbos. Spent the afternoon on the beach. Gorgeous. Uh, now Israeli soldiers are there once again, that same They're beach. not quite there because that's further south, but maybe by the time this recording is out. Because the Gush Katif, the Jewish communities, were not in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. They were in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. You know, south and all the way by the water, all the way uh, west. But yeah, it was gorgeous, amazing. And now they're back there. And I think that we all have to – oh, we're encouraged to say that – when we bond together as a nation, our forces are multiplied. And when we do mitzvahs and kindness and we try to elevate that, that benefit reverberates and, and cascades throughout the nation. And if someone studies Torah, someone says, says prayers, says to him, says psalms, does kindness, that will help the rest of our nation, wherever they may be, the soldiers, the hostages in Gaza, the people who are 
being bombarded. And hopefully this will raise more awareness about benevolence in general, kidney donations, altruistic kidneys, kidney donations in particular, and hopefully that will benefit uh, our nation. Is there an email address that you want people? You don't want people to drive me crazy. Don't drive Rabbi Gwartz crazy. Drive me crazy. My email address is rabbiwalbajima.com. Thank you so much, Rabbi Moshe Gwartz, for joining us on the podcast, coming to the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, and thank you for the incredible work that you do on behalf of the nation and on behalf of all these incredible donors and recipients and uh, renewal. It's just an incredible crown jewel of the Jewish nation. Thank you. Thanks for having me.